Centre for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Peter Victor, who is the author of a book called Managing Without Growth, Slower by Design, Not Disaster. He's a professor in environmental studies uh, close by York University. He's worked for many, many years in Canada and abroad on economy and environment as an academic consultant and a public servant. Dr. Victor was the founding president of the Canadian Society of Ecological Economics and a past president of the Royal Canadian Institute for the Advancement of Science. And let me just say that if you don't know about RCI, I'd strongly encourage you to check out their Sunday afternoon lecture series. It's uh, really quite uh, at the cutting edge as far as bringing science to the public's attention. And it takes place right at U of T every Sunday. Uh, Dr. Victor is currently a member of the board of the David Suzuki Foundation and several advisory boards in the public and private sectors. So please help me to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Peter Victor. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I admire all of you, I suppose, for for giving up a couple hours more lovely sunshine to come and talk about managing without growth, but I'm here too, so we're all making the same sacrifice. Um, let me just say a couple of uh, preliminary words. Uh, when I talk about growth, I'm talking about economic growth as conventionally measured. I am an economist, and I work in an environmental studies faculty. My formal training is in economics. And, uh, and I think it's particularly fitting that um, I'm making this presentation to you in the Center for Inquiry because uh, I approach this topic about whether we could, in fact, manage without relying on economic growth out of a sense of inquiry. I think, as I'll uh, explain in my uh, subsequent remarks, the various reasons why I think we should seriously consider uh, giving far, far less attention than we currently do to the pursuit of economic growth. But I, I approached it as something that I wanted to find out more about. So I'm very, very happy to be, I think, in the right place to talk to you about this topic. So um, what I'm going to do is base my remarks on the book. There's a lot I have to say, a lot more in the book than I'll be able to cover in the 45 minutes or so. So let me, um, let me just tell you what I plan to do. I want to put forward the view that it's very important to understand economies as subsystems of the biosphere. Uh, then I'll talk about the excessive burden that our economies are placing on the biosphere. I'll say something about technology. I think technology has a very important role to play in, in helping us uh, alleviate some of these problems, but I, uh, by no means sufficient. Which leads me to an important uh, preliminary conclusion that we have to address the scale of our economy as well as how efficiently or it works, which we sometimes measure through this concept of intensity. More about that later. Then I think of that uh, just a reminder to everybody here that this uh, questioning of economic growth is really quite widespread now, uh, more so now than when the book came out in, in 2008. And uh, that's worth noting. Uh, in terms of... Um, whom I, I'm really trying to direct my remarks to, it's very much countries like ours, which are, are, are wealthy and I think have the capacity to deal with the problems that we're well aware of without uh, relying on economic growth. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a position I'm taking with respect to the poorer countries, so we have to go first. Then I'll talk briefly about the results of some simulation work that I've done, uh, where I've built my own macro model of the Canadian economy, to lay out some of those results for you, and then a few conclusions. And after that, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Well, I can't quite see what's showing. Oh, there we are. The globe. That's our home. Um, and uh, as you know, we're not taking very good care of it. And one of the ways of understanding the reasons why we're not taking good care of it is to understand how our economy functions, the kind of information that people in the economy use and what information they don't use to make decisions. It involves looking at the way our organizations are set up, what their motivations are, and so on. So understanding econ economics is really important to my mind for understanding how we're making such a mess of things in terms of our relationship to the environment. This is another uh, rather attractive picture. This one uh, is more dynamic, and it shows the growth and dieback of of biomass over the course of, uh, several, uh, of a year. You can see the seasonal fluctuations on, on land and, uh, and in the ocean. And it's just one of the more obvious and easy to see cycles that humans are increasingly interfering with. There are, there are many others, but this is, a, this is a very obvious one. Now, at this point, I want to say that um, 
I have a certain envy for people who come out of the natural sciences to address environmental issues because these are the kind of graphics that they're very accustomed to using. But if uh, you have the background that I do, which is in economics, or you've even studied some economics, you will have seen that economists uh, make do with graphics that are often far less attractive. Um, this is the sort of diagram that we still use, I'm sorry to say, to introduce students uh, of economics to what an economy is. It shows, I'll make it move because it looks nicer, but it shows how firms and households interact. The firms supply the goods and services to households who send money in the other direction, and the households are the ultimate owners of the land, labor, and capital, which firms use in order to make the goods and services, and so money goes in, that di in the opposite direction. And you have this circular flow of, of of income. Um, we make a lot out of this in economics. And I don't want to belittle the, the, the great work that economists have done in understanding how this sort of system operates. But if you want to understand how it relates to the natural environment, it's hopeless because there is no natural environment. It's as if this is a freestanding economic system that has no dependency on the biosphere in which it's embedded. So what I like to do in my work is to, uh, is to add in a lot of the missing pieces. So let's start with um, the, the fundamental sources of materials and energy which come the, from the biosphere and at some point are drawn directly into the economic system. Now, one of the things we know from fundamental physical laws is that all of the material and energy that enters the economy ultimately leaves, uh, and if it leaves in quantities which are too great for where we deposit the waste, then we get a whole variety of environmental problems. Um, and uh, in fact, most of the material that we take into the economy leaves the economy very, very fast, uh, much almost immediately and most within a year. Um, if we start overloading the natural systems of the planet, what happens is we start interfering with these biophysical cycles. That can have a feedback on the capacity of the natural systems of the, of the planet to provide a whole host of services like pollination, flood control, and that sort of thing. And all this is happening on planet Earth. So what ecological economics is all about, if you haven't heard that term before, is it tries to understand the economy as a subsystem of the biosphere, not as the economy here and the environment here, but the one embedded inside the other. And it's really this perspective that has given myself and, and now many others a cause for concern that if we can't keep expanding the production of goods and services in the economy without overloading the capacity of the biosphere to support that activity. But by no means everybody uh, accepts that perspective. I want to just say a few words about economic growth. And I'm going to illustrate my uh, remarks with this picture. This is a picture taken at the founding convention of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's the organization that all of the developed countries belong to. It started in 1960. And um, it is, well, no one can ever point to exact the, the time at which economic growth gained uh, prominence, but it is, a, it is around that time, in the late 50s, early 60s, when uh, e economists and, uh, and people involved in public policy um, started looking at the pursuit of economic growth as an important public policy objective. Here's a quote from a book which I rely on quite a lot in my own work uh, by a Professor Arndt, published in 1978, when he looked at the history of the idea of economic growth. And the quote is, he says, hardly a trace of interest, there was hardly a trace of interest in economic growth as a policy objective in the official or professional literature of Western countries before 1950. So, we tend to think that economic growth, which we read about all the time, it's always in the media, um, uh, is just something that we've always paid the same kind of attention to. Well, that just turns out not to be the case. And it's certainly not been the case in terms of an explicit policy objective uh, of the government. So that's just a little bit of an aside, but it's an important reminder because when we challenge what seems to be a deeply embedded idea like economic growth, it's important to know that, in fact, for most of human history, uh, we managed to live without the idea of the pursuit of economic growth being central to our lives. Second point, the excessive burden on the environment. There was a very important a paper published in Nature in October last year uh, where a number of uh, scientists had got together and identified nine areas of great concern. And you can see them listed around the outside of that circle. I won't read them all, but at the top you have climate change and then ozone acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, and so on. 
And then in the center of this diagram uh, is represent that green circle represents, if you like, the safe operating space for humanity. There's some extent to which, of course, we can live on planet Earth. No one, no one would question that. But that if we go beyond um, certain levels of interaction and imposition on, on the planet, then we're going to create problems. And they, these scientists uh, put forward the position that with respect to at least three of these issues, climate change, uh, ni the nitrogen cycle, and biodiversity loss, we've already gone beyond the safe operating space on planet Earth. And that hasn't happened in isolation of economic growth. Of course, it's happened very much because through our economic activities, the increasing use of materials to produce goods and services, we're having uh, these increasing impacts on the planet. There's, of course, a lot more that could be said about each of those, but I think this is a nice summary of the sort of range of problems that we are now facing at the global level. Of course, there are regional and local problems as well. Now, to understand how this has come about, it's helpful to look at some historical data. This is data on global materials extraction uh, of the uh, 20th century. Starting in 1900 and taking us up to the mid-century, you can see how uh, there was a gradual increase in use of biomass, fossil fuels, ores uh, and industrial materials and construction materials. Over that 50-year period, uh, the global extraction of materials doubled. Steady increase. But look what happened in the next half century. Well, it's half century plus five years went up by 700%. That's a massive, massive increase in the, in the extent to which we draw on the planet for the resources that, that drive our economy. Um, there are, and, and I think it's very much related, of course, to the uh, concern now we have about exceeding these planetary boundaries. But there are also concerns in relation to economic growth about whether we can continue to rely on the planet to supply ever-increasing quantities of materials uh, to support our expanding economies. A very recent report, which um, probably you haven't seen yet, just, just came out, I think, last week, but it's really worth taking a look at. I've only read the executive summary myself, but I wanted to mention it to you. It's a report done for the uh, European Union on critical raw materials. And uh, it's an interesting report for a number of reasons. They identify, uh, I think it's 14... Uh, but I'll give you the number. It's uh, maybe I'm not sure if it's 14 or 41, but they identify a range of critical materials and then point out where uh, the supplies are located. And you'll see most are located in the southern part of the planet, um, none in Europe. Uh, what I find really quite interesting is the, the way they approach the problem uh, as Europe sees it. They look at it in terms of two types of risk that Europe is exposed to supply risk and environmental country risk. And um, I don't know if your reaction to this would be the same as mine, but uh, anyway, this is what they mean by these things. So supply risk, they talk about political and economic stability of the producing countries. Now, they use that terminology, but in fact, one of the concerns they have is that a lot of these countries uh, uh, seem to want to use these materials for their own development. And the Europeans are very concerned that they'll be denied access. They call that political and economic instability, but I think that's, I, I would interpret differently. They look at the um, potential for substitution of these materials and the recycling rate, and then they identify a number of materials that they think uh, represent a supply risk to Europe. The environmental country risk um, struck me as really strange. This is essentially a quote from the report. They say that in these countries where these materials reside, measures might be taken by countries with weak environmental performance to protect the environment, and so endanger the supply of raw materials to the EU. I found that quickly quite bizarre and, 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 and amazingly honest on their part. Um, but it all sort of adds to the picture. Now, this report deals mostly with um, relatively rare materials. Um, it's really important also for us to consider energy supply. If you look at world fossil fuel use going back 2,000 years, this has a long history to it, um, we virtually use none uh, until very recently. And it's pretty clear, and becoming clearer with the work of a fine uh, economist called Robert Ayers, that the economic growth that we've um, benefited from has been fundamentally related to the increasing use we've made of fossil fuels. And uh, why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem partly because it's a major source of, of, of greenhouse gases, but also because uh, one of those fossil fuels, oil, uh, now looks like um, it's uh, facing a peak in terms of production levels. 
So here's a graph, goes from 1950 forward to 2030. Some, some of this is a projection, therefore. And the red line, showing up all right, uh, the red uh, diamonds show the annual discoveries of, of conventional sources of oil and that they peaked in the 1960s. In other words, there was more oil discovered in the 1960s than there has been ever since then. Uh, this question of discoveries is complicated, and I'm going over stuff fairly rapidly. Um, there's the question of what happens if you discover oil, then later on you revise your estimate of what was there. Does that count as a new discovery, or is it backdated to the original one? So there's room for some debate here. But the basic story, though, is that the amount of oil we've extracted, shown by the green line, has continued to increase year after year, and the amount that we keep finding is, has been declining. And as of the early 90s, production began to exceed uh, discoveries and can do that for a while. Uh, but eventually, you can't produce oil that you haven't discovered, and so many analysts are predicting uh, a downturn in the uh, availability of oil from these conventional sources. This is not no longer just a view held by a few um, uh, um, critics who are sort of not in the mainstream. Here's a quote from the chief economist of the International Energy Agency, part of the OECD, who said the output of conventional oil will peak in 2020 if oil demand grows on a business as, as usual basis. So this is something that's begun to enter the mainstream. What I think is pretty clear is that we're going to have to make a major energy transition. So let me say something about that. We've done it before. We know something about energy transitions. They're not easy to do. Uh, if we started with wood, and then in the early part of the Industrial Revolution, we switched to coal to drive these big uh, steam engines that were very, very inefficient, and then subsequently we diversified into oil, gas, and then we produced electricity, mostly as a secondary source of energy. That transition from coal to where we are today uh, took a couple of hundred years, and in that process, we massively expanded the amount of energy we get from fossil fuel, a 20-fold, more than 20-fold increase couple of observations to make. One is that the transition, uh, especially through the fossil fuels, wasn't, um, was facilitated by a number of things. We were moving to fuels that were cleaner, that were more, um, uh, more efficient, uh, more convenient, uh, and often at lower cost. And so it was not that difficult for, for people to make the switch. As much as I favor uh, renewables, um, right now, they don't, they, you really can't describe them that, that way. They're, they're cleaner, but they're not more convenient necessarily. You've got the intermittency problem of wind energy and solar. They're not uh, less costly except in very specific uses. And yet we've got to make, I believe, an energy transition of significant proportions in the next half century. So that is a fundamental problem. So it raises the question as whether more economic growth is going to make that easier or harder, and I'm going to come back to that later. But what it does mean is that we've got of course, to look to technology to help us deal with some of these problems. And I believe that technology uh, can and needs to be helpful, but it's not sufficient. Let me give you uh, some, uh, some background on this. Um, I'm going to pick computers as an example. This is what a computer looked like the year I was born. Um, and uh, you can see that it took a lot of people uh, dressed quite formally to, uh, to get the machine to do some what we would now call rather elementary calculations. Um, 1970, which is significant in my life because that's when I was finishing my doctorate and that was the kind of computer that I was using, but it's also as far back in the past as 2050 is in the future. So there are quite a few people in this room who I think have a very clear recollection of 1970. Doesn't seem that long ago, and yet we're talking about making major changes by mid-century. So it's, it's a real challenge. The world's in color now in 1970, at least when the computers were a bit better. By 1992, which is more or less the year that students coming into our universities right now were born, uh, that's what a computer looked like, and right now something like this. Here's a telephone example. That's what a telephone looked like in 1946, and uh, it didn't change much by 1968. It was colored. I said this could have been 1970, about that time. Um, but you'll notice one thing. You see in the, the, the earlier phone had that little tray at the bottom? That's where you kept your, photo, your phone numbers. That was dropped out in the more modern phone, which is an example to me of how technology can sometimes go backwards. Um, here's 1992. We're into um, cordless phones, and right now, who'd know that was a phone if 
it came forward from 1946 to 1968. Now, this is miniaturization in, in evidence, and it's, it's incredible what's been accomplished through miniaturization. But what is sometimes forgotten is that minimization or miniaturization has allowed us to build um, equipment uh, on, a, on a magnificent scale, on a huge scale. So, for example, here's a truck which you couldn't have designed, built, or operate without, uh, without computers. So it's computers that have allowed us to build big technology, and it's the big technology as much as anything else which is having a, a bad impacts on the environment. Here's the world's largest earth-moving machine. Um, look at the size of that thing. Again, it's miniaturization that makes this kind of technology possible. I have a feeling my next slide's not going to show, so I'll move on to the next one. Here's, um, here's some of those trucks in operation. Um, uh, this is a, t uh, a photograph from our own tar sands. Again, it's miniaturization that's making this kind of impact on the environment possible. And here's, uh, here's what it looks like, um, real, a real environmental disaster. Uh, in terms of the urban scape, here's a rather typical urban scene. You can see a fair number of fairly large buildings. And then they added this. And again, it was miniaturization that's made that possible. And I, I must admit, I found it a little bit amusing. They had to close it down within a couple of weeks because they had a problem running the, the elevators, uh, something with the computers. Um, the final example I want to show you of very large-scale technology is this. This is the world's largest cruise ship. Um, it's kind of daunting just to look at, but what really struck me when I read about this in the Star a few months ago was what the project engineer had to say about it. I would say this is the most environmentally friendly cruise ship to date, much more efficient than other similar ships. So you see what's happening here. Looking at this and thinking of it in terms of per person, assuming that all, every room was full, every berth is taken, the per person impact of this kind of vessel could be quite low. But the scale is so big that the overall impact, I, I submit, is, is really significant. Just imagine when it stops at one of those uh, islands in the West Indies and 4,000 people get off all at one go. This, what I've shown you now is an example of something which is really quite widespread and yet hasn't received as much attention as it should have. And this is called the rebound effect. First identified, by the way, in the mid-19th century by Stanley Jevons when he was writing about coal. Here's an example of where we try to save energy by making the car more efficient. And on its own, that should save, less, uh, should save energy. But there are certain consequences that flow from that. First of all, if you have a more efficient car, it means you've got lower running costs than if you had a less efficient car. It would encourage drivers to drive further, use the car more often. That reduces the overall energy savings. In addition to that, depending on what vehicle you're talking about, and there was quite a debate about the Prius some time ago, about it, the fact that it used such a lot of energy to make it, you can have a problem that you embody more energy in the product even though it uses less when it's being used. But let's, let's accept all that and recognize that it's more efficient, maybe less than had been anticipated, and so the users save money because they've got a, a more efficient vehicle. Well, what do you do with the money? This is all part of the rebound effect. If you use it to take a holiday in Spain, yeah. So the overall impact to save energy from making individual products more efficient can be significantly less than it first appears. And in one of the best studies on this, I took this slide from the study, the UEK ERC study, they estimate overall the rebound effect probably about 50%. There's big variation in that, but 50% of, of the energy savings you think you're going to get by being more efficient. And finally, on the technology front, let's just look at what we did here in Canada, I think to our disgrace. That shows you the increase, gradual increase, in the catch of Atlantic cod from 1850 till about 1950. And then what happened? New technology came in. These factory ships that were much better at finding the, the, the fish, catching them, and, and staying out in the sea for longer. And so in comes the new technology, up goes the catch, and then it crashes. So, Technology, as I say, it can be helpful, but I, I don't believe it's sufficient. Conclusion then for me is that we have to address scale, size, whatever word you want to use, as well as intensity. Intensity being something like energy per, per kilometer traveled or energy per, per dollar of, of, of uh, economic output. So let's look at energy intensity first of all. It is declining. This is good news, but it's not fast enough. This is data for the whole world from 1980 to 2005. 
And the lowest line there shows energy intensity. So that's energy per dollar of world economic output. And you can see how it's been in steady decline. That's really good news. The trouble is that the scale of the economy, the world GDP, has risen much faster than intensity has declined. And so the overall impact has been that primary energy use has increased by a very, very significant amount. Key message. Environmental impact depends upon intensity and scale. You get the same story with materials. That was energy, this is material use. Material intensity has declined, that's very good news. But GDP has increased by even more and so resource extraction has risen. I emphasize this for, for another reason. And that is that when we, when we look at greenhouse gases, which is always very central to these kinds of discussions, but it's not the only concern, as I hope I've illustrated, um, a lot of policy is, is often devoted to intensity. Let's become more efficient. And it's the same problem. If you become more efficient, that's good. But if at the same time you increase scale so that it overwhelms the gain in efficiency, uh, you're not going to make enough progress. After I finished the book, I wanted to look further into this issue. So I'm going to show you a bit of uh, analysis that's not in the book. Um, hope you find it interesting. Uh, not too technical for a Friday evening. What this graph shows is on the upright axis the scale of the Canadian economy, our gross domestic product, a measure of all of the goods and services that we buy in a, in a year as final purchases. And on the bottom axis it shows greenhouse gas per dollar of Canada's gross domestic product. And in 1990, that's the base year for the Kyoto Accord, that was our gross domestic product. And this was our greenhouse gas intensity. And if you multiply intensity by scale, you get the total emissions of greenhouse gases. So in 1990, we were putting out 592 megatons of greenhouse gases converted to a CO2 equivalent. Now, we could have put out the same amount of greenhouse gas with a more uh, uh, efficient economy, in other words, one with a lower intensity, less greenhouse gas per dollar, and a larger economy. So I've drawn all those combinations. Anywhere along that red line gives you a combination of scale and intensity that gives you 592 megatons of emissions. Bigger economy, lower intensity, and so on. If we're on the far side of that red, red line, it's a combination of scale and intensity that would give us an increase, a higher level of emissions than 592. And if we're on this side of that line, we would have a combination of scale and intensity that would give us lower greenhouse gas emissions. I use this to define some thing which we often hear of in the media but doesn't usually get defined, and that's green growth. We hear about the green economy, green growth, but it doesn't usually get defined. Here's my definition. Green growth is any movement from 1990 to 1990 point into that triangle because that would give us a combination of an economy at least as big as we had in 1990, maybe bigger, and smaller intensity where the total emissions would go down. So just to have more efficient output does not in itself give us green growth because you can have brown growth. See, in that, I call it, allow me to call it a triangle, um, we've got lower intensity, but we've got an economy that's so big that when you put the two together, total emissions have gone up. So green growth, I think, has to be defined in terms of both scale and intensity. You can also have black growth. I mean, I'm going to fill out every quadrant here. Once I got started, I couldn't stop myself. Um, you can have degrowth. You can shrink the economy and have lower or higher intensity and reduce total emissions. But even with a smaller economy, if intensity gets too high, you can actually increase emissions. Now, I use this device to look at what's happened in the past and what might happen in the future. So let's look at the USA from 1990 to 2008. They started out, as you can see, their GDP somewhere around here and their intensity where it's shown, and the total, uh, that should be megatons, by the way, 6,148 megatons. I revised this last night because the 2008 data has just come out. But let me show you what happened uh, between 1990 and 2008. Every dot that comes on the graph is an additional year. And you'll see how the U.S. economy grew and intensity declined, the result being, however, that total emissions went up because intensity outgrew the reduction, sorry, growth, uh, the scale rather, outgrew the reduction in intensity. Um, if you look at Britain, um, Britain, unlike the US, had a Kyoto target. So they said they would reduce their emissions down to 676 megatons, which would be anywhere along this lower, lower line, anywhere along that purple line. Let's see how the Brits managed. 
I've shown this graph in Britain. It's always considered the high point of the presentation. Um, they don't quite know how they did it, but they're very glad that they did. Uh, so that's the British story. Um, Canada, you know, they sometimes say that we, uh, we're somewhere between the Americans and, and the Brits. Well, um, like the, the Brits, we have a Kyoto target, but we behave like Americans. In fact, in proportional terms, we're worse. You can see we're getting way beyond our Kyoto target. So if we take 2008 as where we are now, it's be pretty, pretty much, we don't have the data yet, but it will be somewhere close to that, and take that 734 megatons you, I've got now on the far right of the diagram as our starting point, and you say, well, what might be we, we achieve over the next 50 years? And I pick, for reasons I don't necessarily have to go into, an 87% reduction in our emissions over 50 years. Well, we, we want to do it by green growth of some sort. If we do it with no growth at all, it's equivalent to traveling along that horizontal line. So that by uh, 50 years from now, the intensity, greenhouse gas intensity of our economy would be only 13% of what it is today. In other words, we put out 0.57 megatons, um, my units, uh, kilotons of, of uh, greenhouse gases per million dollars of gross domestic product, we'd have to be down to 0.07. That's with no growth. That's keeping the scale the same. Now look what happens if we also have economic growth at 2% a year. Now the intensity has got to come down to only 0.03, which would be only 5% of where we are today. And if we try for 3% growth, which is more of our typical of our history, we've essentially got to get rid of all of the greenhouse gas emissions from the Canadian economy in 50 years. So you see this connection between the more we rely on growth and the more difficult it may be, more difficult, not easier, to solve some very important problems. Well, as I said in my introduction, many are questioning growth. Here's an illustration of that. These are articles from various publications, the Gazette in Montreal, the Globe and Mail. Um, you can read the headlines. There's Harper's, the specter of a no-growth world. Here's the Wall Street Journal, new limits to growth, revive Malthusian fears. Here's Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize in Economics, running out of planet to exploit. I <laughs> love that terminology. Harper's, uh, sorry, new, the new scientist, the folly of growth, a whole issue devoted to these questions. Um, the Guardian in the Britain, look at that one. The world's facing a natural resources crisis worse than the financial crunch. Uh, toward a greener economy in the Christian Science Monitor, contemplating life without growth in the star. Here's Spiegel, can economies function without growth? Even The Economist, progress and its perils. That was their Christmas edition last year. Now, a number of us have been writing books. Um, I'll just mention one. Uh, you know, there are, there are others. Um, here's a report, similar title, Prosperity Without Growth, question mark. Um, this was a report done for the UK Sustainable Development Commission, and, and it d covers these issues very well. You can download that free, or you can buy the book version, which has the same title without the question mark. Um, and here's a, a recent report from the New Economics Foundation in Britain, Growth Isn't Possible. And finally, I'll mention the, Canadi the Center, rather, not Canadian, Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy. Uh, and you can see it's on Facebook. And uh, I've been to a number of conferences recently discussing these issues. And it's really interesting to see um, how many young people are getting involved, which is really encouraging. Um, one of the lines of argument, I've mentioned very much the biophysical concerns, but there's another line of argument which is supporting this, these inquiries into, into managing without growth, and it concerns the, uh, the, what some of the data at least is saying, and that is that beyond a certain level of economic um, well-being, uh, people don't seem to say they're any happier. So this is cross-sectional data. This is data taken at the same time, but for many different countries. And you can see that you get this sort of result that uh, as people get richer, if, you can, if, you can, if it's legitimate to compare people in different countries in this way, as people get richer, to a certain point, they also report that they're happier. And then comes a later stage where getting richer doesn't, doesn't show up that way. If you take data over a period of time for the US, and they've, they continue to lead the world in the, some of the data they gather, this shows from 1945 to 2005 two things. One is the gross domestic product per person, that's shown by the blue line, and the percentage of Americans who year by year define themselves or describe themselves as very happy. And you can see that up to about 1975, broadly speaking, those curves move together. They're not exactly the same. But look what happens after 1975. 
So that's another sort of indication that there is a, a disconnect between how happy we feel and how, how much income we have, which we ought to take as good news if you accept the argument that economic growth for biophysical reasons also has limits. Now, coming at this question of, of how people think about themselves and, uh, and, and income from a very different point of view, we have something called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which starts from the gross domestic product, takes consumption expenditures, but recognizes that many things that matter to people's well-being, such as voluntary work, uh, such as the amount of time, leisure time you have, um, these things don't show up in, in gross domestic product. But what does show up in gross domestic product, if, if we spend more time commuting and spend more money to commute, that goes into GDP. So things like that are taken out. Anyway, after a long series of adjustments to get what is a more deliberate measure of well-being, because GDP was never intended as a measure of well-being, by the way, this is what you find. Again, this is for the US. You see these two curves moving together up until about 1970, uh, GDP being the upper one. And then after that, it looks just like the happiness data. In other words, analytically and by asking people, you get a very similar story. And it's not just the US. The uh, Australian uh, data shows a similar divergence between GDP per capita and GPI. So I just mention this because there's this second line of argument about why managing without growth uh, may begin to look more attractive than maybe when you first came into the room um, uh, that we need to pay some attention to. Okay, well now having laid this groundwork, I want to just put forward the submission that because we live in a world of such significant global inequalities, it's pretty clear that the rich countries should go first. To illustrate that, here is the food consumption of four families. Um, I don't know how clearly you can see it. It looks a bit dark, but you can probably get enough information from it to see what's going on. This is a German family. On the far right, we have an Ecuadorian family. Here's a family in Bhutan. And then over there, we have a family in a refugee camp in Chad. And you can see the massive disparity between food consumption on a weekly basis. And I know the Center for Inquiry prides itself on the use of science and what I'm going to say now is not scientific, but whenever I look at these photos myself, I can't help but see that the only people not smiling are up here, <laughs> probably worried about consuming all that in a week. Um, so what does it mean to go first? Well, I decided to approach this problem by building my own macroeconomic model of the Canadian economy. Um, I tried to make it as conventional as possible, but I used it to um, address a question that uh, is not typically asked by economists, and you see it up there, can we have full employment, no poverty, fiscal balance, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions without relying on economic growth? <laughs> That's the answer. Um, at least the computer can generate scenarios that show that the pieces could fit together. And I'm the first to recognize that just because you can generate a scenario on a computer doesn't mean you can bring it about in practice, but I do have a lot to say about that in the later chapters of the book. So let me tell you something about this work. Let me start by talking about what makes an economy grow. Well, there are different ways of looking at this um, from a rather Keynesian perspective, which when I wrote the book wasn't really very well regarded. And all of a sudden, when we had the recession, Keynes was rediscovered, so I don't feel quite so bad about it. But you can look at it from the point of view of what we spend our money on. If we spend more money on certain things, that shows up as an increase in gross domestic product. So what we spend on consumption in the, stock, in the shops uh, is part of gross domestic product. When businesses buy new equipment, um, that goes into gross domestic product. If government spends money on goods and services, that's also in gross domestic product. And if we run a trade balance, if we sell more to others than we buy from them, that goes into our GDP. So all of those are represented in, in my macro model logo. You can also look at growth from a supply side. What, what are we capable of producing? Well, that's going to depend upon our labor force, its size and its skills, uh, on our capital stock, what, is the, what are the machines and equipment and infrastructure that we have to work with, and then a whole host of things which influence productivity, how well organized we are, uh, how efficient we are, how good we are at generating new ideas, and so on. So in, in, in the model, all of these things are represented, uh, and I estimate uh, relationships statistically and then create what is typically called a business as usual scenario which is really a way of saying if the next 30 years were like the last 30 years with a few things changing like a larger population and so on what what would what would that look like um, and here's what the model 
um, puts out. The black line is gross domestic product per person continuing to rise steadily in Canada. This model doesn't deal with the ups and downs that happen within a year or even from one year to the next. It sort of smooths those things out. But that's because it's designed to look at, at longer term questions. You can see greenhouse gas emissions would continue to rise, not as fast as GDP per capita because we're still getting that gain in intensity reduction. Uh, unemployment doesn't do very much, goes up, comes down again, pretty much back to where it was in 2005. Um, the government's debt to GDP ratio, a measure of fiscal integrity, if you like, uh, declines. But I did this run before the recession. I will be doing uh, some revisions to that. But you can see the business as usual scenario looked pretty healthy. It was also before the government reduced a couple of taxes quite significantly. But what is particularly disturbing about this, apart from the greenhouse gas emissions, is what it says about poverty. Now, in the model, I use the UN's Human Poverty Index. That's a composite of uh, in an income measure, uh, a measure of adult illiteracy, and a measure of longevity beyond the age of 60. And you can see that what it says is that over the period of 2005 to 2035, if history more or less repeats itself, there will be more poor Canadians at the end of the, that than at the beginning. Now, that's largely because there will be more Canadians. So proportionally, the proportions don't change, but we ought to be doing better than this with an economy that's going to be more than twice as large in 2035 as it is now. This is not a very, to me, a very attractive scenario, but it's, it's, it's kind of business as usual. So then I said, well, what would happen if we eliminated all of those sources of economic growth starting in 2010, sort of wound them all down to nothing? So there was no forces of growth in the economy by 2020. And you would expect it to be disastrous. And it, it, I, it is. It would be terrible just to do this in the most clumsy fashion. Um, unemployment goes off the map. Uh, poverty goes up very high. The debt to GDP ratio gets completely unmanageable. GDP per capita, you can see on the far right, the black line has leveled off. It takes a while for it to work its way through the system, all those changes I make. But you do get that stability. And greenhouse gas emissions come down. Um, but this is a, fi a frightening scenario, and it's, it's the sort of thing, although people don't necessarily draw pictures like this, but it, it, it's the sort of thing that has people very worried about, well, we must have growth, because without growth we won't have full employment, and we won't be able to pay for the reduction in, 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 in greenhouse gas emissions, and so on and so on. But for the reasons I gave you in the early part of my talk, there's more to it than that. The economy is embedded in the biosphere, and we're damaging the biosphere. What are we going to do to, to, to back away from that? So you get people like Larry Elliott, the economics editor of The Guardian in, in, uh, in Britain, who wrote, who wrote, the real issue is whether it's possible to challenge the growth at any cost model and come up with an alternative that is environmentally benign, economically robust, and politically feasible. So I wrote to him and said, yes. The answer is yes, and here's what it looks like. So again, what I did was introduce a number of changes starting in 2010 uh, that were deliberately designed to slow down the growth rate until there's no growth in GDP per capita per person at the, at the, at the end from about 2028. But you can see unemployment comes down. It would be lower at the end of this scenario than it's been in the last 50 years in Canada. Greenhouse gas emissions are way down. Uh, the poverty index has come down. It would be the lowest in the world. And the debt to GDP ratio of the government is still looking very healthy. Well, how does that happen? Well, um, let me give you um, a quick uh, look-see at the sorts of things that I assumed uh, to make this scenario come about. Well, this isn't actually in the scenario, but I do believe we have to have new meanings and measures of success. Uh, some people ask me when they hear my presentation, well, why don't I have the Human Development Index in there or, or the Happiness Index? And, uh, and um, there are, I, I have answers for that. So I'm very happy, though, very pleased that people are looking at different ways of measuring how, we're, how well we're doing. There's the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, which is, uh, will be out, I hope, uh, fairly soon, uh, which is an attempt to do that. And same sorts of things are going on in other countries at all levels. Global, national, regional, community, individual, we, I think, have to reevaluate what we mean by success. I think we've also got to have um, limits on the extent to which we allow ourselves to extract materials, in particular, uh, and energy from, from nature, and the extent to which we put waste back into nature. And we've also got to be stricter on how we on how we allow ourselves to use land, because we are crowding out other species. That's why we're getting this biodiversity loss. 
in the scenario, those two first two points are sort of background, but in the scenario specifically, population is stabilized and the labor force is stabilized. Um, there's a more efficient capital stock is part of this. That's one of the reasons we get greenhouse gas emissions coming down. That happens also, it's brought about by the carbon price. I put a price for carbon in the model. And by the way, this model is available on the internet. Anybody can run it and, and develop your own scenarios. Um, a shorter work here. It seems fundamental that if we're going to not expand output, but we are still going to become more productive, if we're going to avoid an increase in unemployment, the answer has to be we have to share out the work in a different way. Uh, Trickle-down hasn't worked for dealing with poverty. We need more generous anti-poverty programs, and they are represented in the model. So I mentioned uh, adult illiteracy and, and longevity. So there's, uh, I found some relationships in the literature which showed if you spend money in certain ways, you can bring those things down. They're, they're included in, in low grow. This isn't in the model, but it's discussed in the book uh, to, a, to an extent, and that is that whilst we continue to uh, try to establish our status in society by buying things, we're doomed, I think. It really comes back to the first point. We need new meanings and measures of success and new ways of representing that. Um, to reduce the prominence of status goods, I think we have to more, have more informative advertising and not advertising which tries to persuade us to pursue lives that I don't think are there for us uh, in general anymore to have. And in my own sphere, which is education, I think we've got to get back to being aware that we're educating people for life, not just for work. I think we've gone too far down the other road. Now, I mentioned earlier the degrowth concept. All this, this nice scenario, I think it's quite nice, you know, still has growth. We'd be richer by 2035 than we are now on a per person basis. Look, it goes from 100 up to about a 160. But there's quite an interest, more in Europe than here, uh, in North America in, in degrowth, in a deliberate attempt to shrink the economy because we've overshot the capacity of the biosphere to support us. So in March, I went to a conference in Barcelona. It was the second international conference on, on degrowth. And um, it was, uh, there must have been hundreds of people there and incredibly lively dialogue and lots of argument and disagreement. So uh, I spoke at the conference and what I did there was to produce a degrowth scenario using my model, but to see what would happen, what, it might, what might it look like in Canada if we deliberately shrunk the economy. I'm not saying that I'm advocating that, but I think, I think in, the, in the spirit of inquiry, it's worth taking a look at it. So here's how I went about creating a degrowth scenario for, for Canada. I mean, if we're going to shrink, okay, but to what? To what level would be reasonable? So I started out by thinking, well, what would be the total size of the global economy that might be sustainable? And as a guide to that, I looked at the literature on the ecological footprint. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen that. And uh, what I found was that it was in 1980 that the estimates of, the, of how we draw on biocapacity matched the, the available biocapacity of the planet. After 1980, the graphs diverge, and we are now exceeding the biocapacity of the planet. So we're, we're running down the biological resources of the planet to support our our way of life. That is, that is um, what the ecological footprint said. So I said, all right, well, I'll, I'll use that. It's as good a place to go as any. That would give me, and I looked then at what the world GDP was in 1980, 17.6 trillion. But then I noted a large part of the global econom uh, ecological footprint comes from carbon. And what they do is they say, well, we put a lot of carbon, sorry, a lot of carbon into the atmosphere where, that can't be absorbed. And then they estimate, well, how much extra land would we have to have to absorb the extra carbon? But if we were more efficient, if we produced less carbon, we could have a bigger uh, global economy. So I thought I would pick a reasonable number, like a 40% reduction in carbon. And that translates into saying that we could have a global economy that roughly the size it was at the turn of the century. So I took that as a measure of what the global, maximum global economy might, might be. Then I said, okay, well, what would the per person uh, economic level be on an on average. Well, I have to divide by population. We've got to have. We know we're going to have some population growth. I took a relatively low number, eight billion. So that says that on average, the planet, if you accept my logic so far, uh, could give us all all eight billion uh, an annual income of thirty eight hundred dollars. Well, what should Canada's GDP per capita be based upon that analysis. Well, why should we be any different from anybody else? 
And that would be one way of generating a degrowth scenario. Um, well, <laughs> it's a laughing matter, but you know, you present this to an international audience where people are living on you know, $500, $600 a year. They didn't see anything wrong with $3,800. Anyway, I understand your, uh, uh, your reaction. So I said, well, maybe we should have a mul be, be, be a multiple. You know, we're, we're maybe in, in a, to a long process of equalization, but we're not going to get there in 30 years. So I picked four times the sustainable level of 3,800, and that would mean a level that we had in 1976. That's roughly where we were in 1976. So I said, okay, what would it mean to degrow the Canadian economy back to where it was, roughly speaking, in 1976? So made a set of assumptions, forced the GDP per capita down to that target level, and managed to get unemployment to come down. It was a struggle. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions come way down. The poverty index leveled off, but at a very low level. And the debt to GDP ratio looking very healthy. So I could force the model to, to give that result. But let me now, to get more insight into what's going on here, because, you know, don't anyone take these, any of these graphs as sort of the final output. The final output is what goes on up here. What thinking, what new thinking do we have about our, our predicament? So let's, I think, aid that by looking at how these scenarios compare. So the, the blue scenario is the business as usual one that I showed you at the beginning. The red scenario is the first low, no growth scenario that I showed where, where GDP per capita levels off, but at a higher level. And the yellow one is the degrowth scenario. You can see what a huge difference there is between degrowth, still assuming Canadians will be four times richer than the average inhabitant of the planet, um, but it's a big, big reduction. Here's, here's the greenhouse gas emission comparison. Well, obviously, the yellow line looks um, very attractive. It's there because we've got a much smaller economy, but we've also got a much heavier, as you'll see, a greenhouse gas uh, tax in, uh, at work. Here's some of the drivers of growth. Uh, here's the population scenarios. For the uh, business as usual scenario, population grows faster than the other two scenarios where I oblige it to stable off. You might ask, how do you bring that about in practice? And we'll maybe talk about that later. Here's working time. As I said before, the way to bring unemployment down with a diminished total amount of work is to share it out differently. Well, you can see there's not a huge difference between the business as usual scenario and leveling off to 2035, as I showed before. But you try it for degrowth. You know, we're down to about one and a half days a week work. Well, that may be quite nice, but getting there... Um, in a smooth fashion, looks like a very tall order. Um, government expenditures. Not a huge difference between the blue and the red scenarios, but the degrowth scenario would involve a massive reduction in government expenditures. And if we're trying to make a smooth transition to a very different way of, of living, uh, that could be problematic. And there's the carbon tax. No carbon tax in the, uh, in the business as usual case. Uh, the, re in the red line shows the carbon tax level for the uh, second scenario I showed you, where we level off, and the uh, yellow line shows a very, very substantial carbon tax um, for the degrowth scenario. So I drew some conclusions from this. Um, by the way, when I showed the degrowth scenario in, in, in Europe, most people said, hey, that's great. Yes. But I, 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 my reaction was, well, that looks pretty damn difficult. Um, but the simulations at least suggest that pro some notion of prosperity, you know, where we've got full employment and we've got uh, poverty way down and, 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 and we've dealt with greenhouse gases, you don't require growth. That's, and at least that's suggested by these, by these runs. Degrowth is a much greater challenge than low and then no growth. And just to point out, as a reminder, that the degrowth target income depends upon our response to the climate crisis. I assumed a 40% reduction. But in both cases, I think that we'll have to have substantial changes in our economic and social systems if we're going to make this, these kinds of adjustments. Well, now I'm going to draw to a close with a final comments. I want to just make an observation that a lot of what I've been saying may strike some of you as really way out there. And in a way, it, it, it was and still is, but less so than you might think. This is um, a photograph of Robert Solo. Nobel Prize winner in economics uh, for his work on economic growth. And the model that I use, in, well, part of my model is based upon his work on economic growth. Here's how he was quoted. 
uh, not that long ago. He says it's possible that the US and Europe will find that either continued growth will be too destructive to the environment and they are too dependent on scarce natural resources or that they would rather use their uh, increasing productivity in the form of leisure. A really nice summary of the no growth scenario that I showed you. If you're interested, he goes on to say, which I don't in my book, by the way, there's no reason at all why capitalism could not survive with slow or even no growth. I should say that if you go and check Harper's for the quote, you'll find um, the wording of the second part of that quote slightly different. There were some double negatives. It wasn't absolutely sure, clear to me what he was saying. So I wrote to him and asked for clarification, and he absolutely clarified that this, this was his meaning. Well, could we adapt to these kinds of changes? Well, I think as a species, we're highly adaptable. That's a bit trite to say, but, it, but there's some truth in that. I'm much more skeptical about the capacity of our institutions to adapt. Here are institutions recognizable, I'm sure, to everyone in this room, um, but they encompass you know, universities, bank, legislature, uh, the legal system, production, commerce, the global institutions and religious institutions. Uh, I've had quite a lot of experience in large institutions, and I am concerned that even when they try to move fast, they only manage to do that slowly. So um, it's, it, this, is a real, this is a real conundrum. However, if we don't adapt, I do think the outlook is very gloomy. Um, and, uh, but it's not where I'm going to leave you, because I don't think that is the only outcome. In fact, I wouldn't spend my time uh, writing and thinking about these things and talking about it if I thought that was somehow inevitable. I think there's a much brighter future out there. And uh, that's my uh, representation of the kind of future that I, I hope we'll see, one of, one of joy and unhappiness. Um, but I do believe if we try to stick to the path that we're on, where we put growth right at the top of our public policy agendas and we test all other policies against what they'll do for growth or competitiveness or productivity or trade, all different ways of saying much the same thing to my mind, I don't think we'll have a happy, a happy future. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Hi, I've been thinking about the consumption issue for quite a uh, for quite a, some time, and I've realized uh, recently that we have three uh, incentive systems geared to maximizing the ground to landfill transfer. We have income tax, where government makes a cut when you earn money. Sales tax makes a cut when you sell or when you uh, buy something, and then uh, then uh, the general profit motive of the sales for per number of widgets produced. So. All three. It's like it's like having a stockbroker and giving him trading authority and giving him commission on every sale. He wants to churn the account, and you end up draining down the resources at the maximum rate. Mm -hmm. So we need to alter the tax system. We need to change the incentive uh, system. I was just pondering perhaps a, a wealth tax like some states in the United States have. Uh, for example, um, if you have a wealth tax on your car of maybe a 1%, there will be an incentive by government to make your car last as long as possible. And then the embodied energy would be reduced, the material consumption would be reduced, and that would maximize their tax revenue. Same with houses, same with many other things. Uh, so we have to look at these rural systems under which we, under which we live, and there are ways to uh, maintain a good standard of living without as much money spent. So the economic numbers might not look at as good, but the actual uh, utility will be there. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, it wasn't a question, so I don't think it really requires <laughs> a response. Of a new incentive Pardon? Uh, do you have any, have you thought about how to change the incentive system? Well, um, one, of the, one of the points that's often made along the lines you're talking about is to observe that we put taxes, say, on, on, on income, um, on things that we really don't want to discourage and we let people do the bad things. And so why don't we switch the tax base onto the bads, things like um, uh, different kinds of pollutants, and also uh, on the extraction of materials. So we discourage what we don't want, and that would allow us to reduce taxes on the things that we do want. For a carbon tax, for example, if, if well, I'm like government, these. okay. If, uh, if I'm the government and I make money off carbon tax, I'm gonna wanna encourage as much carbon consumption as possible. So. We have to think about the whole, how the whole system will work. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, if, if the motivation of a carbon tax is to raise revenue, you said it at one level, if it's to deal with a problem, 
uh, of excess carbon, then you set it at a different level. So yeah, you have to have a very clear idea of, wh of what, what it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay, I'm just wondering how sensitive your model is to population. I mean, you, you did say that you sort of fix population. And with, uh, with the, the sort of example of Britain aside, I would think that uh, the scale is going to be proportional to the population at some point, especially with the growing economies in the developing world. So I'm just wondering how sensitive your model is to yeah. variation in population. And I guess I could add a, another quick question would be, um, how do you get uh, businesses to, to buy into low growth? Because it seems that virtually every business that I've been involved with, growth is, is paramount. Um, Obviously, they owe money to stockholders who kind of push that scenario, but also it seems like there just seems to be a mindset against uh, a plateauing of a company. Yeah. Uh, growth scenarios just seem to be bred in the bones of uh, MBA graduates or something. So I was wondering how you're going to convince those companies to, to sort of plateau and just have constancy. Right. Um, well, the first question about population, uh, the model is somewhat sensitive to population growth. I looked at uh, StatsCan's population uh, projections up until about mid-century, and they offer, as these people do, you know, low, medium, and high. And I took the low scenario, since that was uh, within the bounds of, of possibility. But even that, and that does stabilize without any, any further intervention. Um, the big difference it makes in the outcome is that if you have stable gross domestic product with an increasing population, you're talking about declining gross domestic product per person. So um, at one level, that's the only thing that would change. You could, if you could still stabilize the economy, but you'd be spreading, you'd be sharing out a fixed amount of output, I mean, its composition does change a bit, but a fixed amount of output amongst a growing number of people. So on average, we would get poorer. And for the scenario that I showed you, I wanted to avoid that. So that, that, that would be the main, the main difference. The variation in the size of the population in Canada within those scenarios I talked about between now and 2035 is not that great. And so it, the scale effect of that isn't, isn't, isn't too serious. I won't come in on the stuff about developing countries because really I, you know, my work is not focused on that and I've got nothing fresh to say about it. As for how you persuade business, well, you know, there's no simple answer to that. Um, Maybe there's no answer to it. One of the, one of the uh, themes though, that's coming up in the literature now around these topics is to explore different uh, corporate structures. For example, the cooperative movement is motivated differently from the for-profit movement. Well, what can we learn from that? Um, uh, there's some concern that things are in fact moving in the wrong direction. There was that uh, decision by the Supreme Court in the US not that long ago which underlined the rights of corporations there to have the rights of individuals. That, that's been seen as a, as a retrograde step and that we ought to recognize that when a corporation operates in our society, it does so with a license from the community. And so what we're into then is really respecifying the nature of, of that license. But if, you know, if, if <laughs> my, the subtitle of my book is Slow by Design, Not Disaster. If we have institutions, not just business, but others too, which don't wish to get off that train, and the, the, there's not the, um, the, the, the political support to, to make a change, then I think we're headed for a, a real um, discontinuity and disruption, uh, and that we will have failed to do that. So we have to sort of um, talk it up, look at different business models. Uh, there are business leaders, by the way, who find this kind of presentation really very much to their liking. Um, but they're not, they're not typical, but they are making a bit of an impression. So I don't really have an answer, but, you know, we're into a dialogue. We're into a discussion. We're into a debate. And maybe the outcome of that will be a, a change of mind and a change of heart and, and so on. Hi, I have two questions for you. We like them together or one after the other? <laughs> well, how can I answer that? I, <laughs> I'm try, them, try them one after the other. Okay, first question. Um, can you think of any historical example where society, society willingly embraced a philosophy of no or degrowth that wasn't um, externally applied by, let's say, war or famine or something like that? And what's the second question? <laughs> <laughs> um, the second question is, assuming um, the no or degrowth scenario, 
how does that take into account finite resources like oil or some of the rare earth materials that were near in um, the peak of like okay um, well the historical examples that come to mind are not at the national level you can find many examples of local communities who have said we don't want to grow but what they lack is very often is the means to to bring that about they're often because they're you know they're the third tier in our country and they they don't have that authority but there are many examples like waterloo comes to mind as one place which said we we want to control growth and have no growth so you can find that sentiment but we haven't seen it at the, at the national level as deliberate policy but bear in mind that what you know what what, what i base most of my argument on is the impact we're having at the global level, which then translate into, well, what then should be the responsibilities of, of nation states be? And you've heard the argument. Well, it's really only in the last, what do you want to say, two, three, four decades that we've begun to realize that we're having these impacts at the global level and therefore have to ask this question. So to say, you know, to, to sort of imply, well, no historical example, so maybe, it, it, I don't know, well, there may be no implication in what, in what you're, in your question, but um, it's new territory. Um, what I am surprised about, though, is, is the rising level of, of interest in political uh, areas to, to discuss this. So, so, you know, something's happening. As for finite resources, well, I mean, that's part of the rationale for the whole um, perspective that, I, that I've offered. I, I like, I, one of the people who's influenced me a lot in, in, in this area is Herman Daly. And uh, he puts forward a number of propositions. One is that we should allow ourselves to use these finite resources, but at a rate that allows us to take some of the returns from their use and invest them in a renewable alternative. Mm -hmm. So that Yes, we will use fossil fuels, but some of the returns from the use of fossil fuels should deliberately be, putting, be put into the creation of renewable alternatives so that future generations are not denied access to energy supplies. So with slower growth, that becomes a more feasible, more tractable way to go. And it's the same with any other non-renewable resource. If, if, you, if, if we're going to find substitutes, we ought to relate the extent and the rate at which we use up these cheap sources of those resources to find suitable substitutes. I think that's a decent strategy. Okay, right? thank you. And there was no implication to my first question. Oh, okay. um, I just didn't know of any example in human history where society like willingly slowed down. Yeah. Sadly, there are many examples of societies that have collapsed because they didn't. I know. You that's know. what kind of scares me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi, Peter. Uh, great lecture again. And, uh, um, I've got two questions as well. Um, first one is about uh, discount rates and growth. Um, when we're making decisions about, uh, uh, say, things like carbon or uh, biodiversity loss, uh, we have to make um, incur costs today uh, for potentially benefits in the future or uh, avoided damages, if you will. Mm. And the way that we relate those two things, as you'd be well aware, is uh, through some sort of a discounting rate, like to, to attach the two. Um, as long as we have an assumption that uh, we're going to be richer in the future, uh, that means a steep discount rate, and that means uh, a large discount rate, and that means that we basically uh, we don't take on these things because the the um, the, the benefits or the avoided damages discount back to today's. Um, uh, levels and, and looking at those costs don't work and I just wonder how we get the assumption of growth out of those discount things I, I, I know that that's not really what you touched on but, no, I, it's, but a, it's, it's a relevant a, question and the other uh, point um, was just about technology that's more of a comment than a um, uh, than a question but you might want to comment on it as well um, Bill Gates made a presentation at TED recently and he was talking in, in some ways about what you're talking about like that our, our damages are you know, population times the cons consumption per capita, and then the, um, the the technology that we use to do that. Hmm. Um, he changed the name from the Kaya equation or the IPAT to the Gates equation he's calling it now. But, um, but um, he basically said that uh, 
we're as a society not going to deal with population we're not going to deal with affluence so we have to put all of our eggs this is gates saying this uh on technology and the thing that um the, yeah well, right. i mean what he does, does for a living <laughs> but this is you know from the yeah. time that uh, i'm just going to make these last two points but we, we have a as a society we have a too big of an expectation as to what technology can do when when Lindbergh flew across the uh, Atlantic, be between the time he did that and 40 years later, uh, state-of-the-art transportation across the Atlantic by air went from the Spirit of St. Louis to the Boeing 747. Yeah. And it's 40 years later, and we are still at the Boeing 747. It's yeah. the same thing when you were talking about the phones. Um, yeah, my phone is in my pocket now, and I have my telephone book in my pocket and all that kind of stuff, but it's not nearly the, the, the shift that we had when we actually went from no phone to phone. And I, I just, it, it seems to me that it's more of a, uh, we all grew up on Star Trek or something, and, and, and we just have a, uh, an unrealistic expectation as to what technology can, can generate. So anyways, the, the, a comment and a question. Please. All right. Well, the, um, the idea that you can understand these problems by looking at population affluence and technology is a, is a, a valuable idea. But there's a tendency sometimes to think that they are uh, separate entities and that you can move one around without it having an impact on the other. Uh, and that's a, a bit of a fault with the, with the iPad equation because it does lend itself to that interpretation. I mean, as, as, as I'm sure Gates will understand, affluence and technology are not unrelated. So to say, well, we're going to have a certain level of affluence and we'll therefore have to focus on technology, you know, you've got to wonder what does that really mean? And what is it you can change under the technology heading that doesn't also affect um, uh, affluence, or maybe even population. I mean, some of the gains that we've had in slowing down the growth in population are very technologically based. It's not just that, of course, but the pill is a, is a piece of technology. So you've got to be a bit careful about trying to, to carve it up quite that way. I think, though, it's, um, uh, it's just wrong to say that we have to accept whatever future level of population comes our way and whatever future level of affluence is, there, is going to be there and just act on technology. I mean, I, I gave, I think, some interesting, I think for me, quite persuasive arguments that you can't do it all by just looking at technology. Scale can overwhelm the gains you make by becoming more efficient. And, and efficiency gains are, are problematic because you can't keep achieving some goal with less and less resources on a, uh, eventually, you, you know, you've got nothing to reduce. So you have to reduce scale. So I, d I mean, I just think his, his, if that's what he said, I think he's either he hasn't thought it through properly, or it's just, it's just, it's just not, it's not the whole answer. Um, you made a comment about about technology, um, and uh, well, I got nothing to say uh, against that. I suppose I, I do think that the iPhone, by the way, which I don't have, uh, is a very big change from. Um, the earlier technology and the opportunities we now have for social networking is something rather new. Um, a mixed blessing, perhaps, but it is, it, is, it is different. And what it might make possible, I think we are yet, yet to discover, but we'll see. Hi. Um, there's one thing, like, in your models, you emphasize, like, the work has to be shared out somehow. Yeah. So, I mean, like, if I wanted to get an economic advantage on somebody else, then if I had all this leisure, I'd go and get a second job or something like that. So, I mean, then you'd have to have some government say, oh, you know, only have one job. But if I have all that leisure, then I'd go, if I really wanted economic advantage, I'd go out and become an entrepreneur because it's my own business. So, I mean, then you can scale it up to like international level. Okay, if, if a country decides on a low growth model, let's say, so they don't go out and take the fish from the ocean. Somebody else is going to go in there if they want that resource and get the uh, fish. So I mean, it seems like the only way to implement something like this where you kind of share out things is some kind of police state of some sort. I, I, I don't know, but can you comment on that? Well, I think you're right to draw attention to um, how bad things could get. Uh, but I don't think it's the only, only possibility. Um, presumably, you make this notion, or you have this notion of a police state because uh, people are being obliged to do something they don't want to do. 
and so you need some sort of police state to make them do it. Um, I don't think that's going to get us there. That if unless there's ultimately widespread support for leading lives rather differently from the way we currently lead them, that we have a different idea of of what success means, what prosperity means, then uh, you've just laid out a version of the disaster scenario. But one of the things I'm picking up now in the literature, and it's kind of, it surprises me a bit, is a growing concern that growth is slowing down and, and that higher prices of energy are going to be what really kicks in to bring the rates of growth down to not necessarily zero, but to something very slow. So even if we don't get there because of the kind of concerns I've expressed, which you know has a strong ethical component too. I didn't stress that in my remarks, but I think that what we're doing to other species is disgraceful. Um, and, and so there's many, many sort of themes that come together. But now if we are obliged to live in economies which don't grow so much with institutions that rely on growth, maybe what you're talking about then comes into play. So unless we get that change in priorities, that change in what we mean by success and what we mean by the good life, then, uh, then we are going to have those kind of clashes and um, it'll be horrible to see. Um, was there a second part to your question? Was that it? Yeah, okay. I just I wondered if you could comment a little bit on more like, like value systems, like personal value systems and so the more micro consumer yeah. things. Uh, because like, you know, I lived back in 1970 and I wasn't that much worse off. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it wasn't such a big thing to make 250 times what the average person makes, that this was status, or that, you know, corporate leaders are making 6,000 times what their average worker was making, you know, is much, much less back then. Um, and, you know, there wasn't such a big thing for women of spending as much money on, on buying stuff, you know, clothes and then throwing it all out. Um, and the, you know, the, um, the thing, you know, even, you know, today, mm -hmm. you know, you go down the street and you see all these, like, plastic and cardboard disposable containers everywhere. That, that just wasn't around in 1960 or 1970. Um, and people didn't, like, you know, drink, like, Coke for breakfast. Um, to the, and, you know, it was, it was like, you know, I don't think we're really getting ahead this way. Um, and so, you know, again, like plastic and disposable things, you know, many old people who went through the Depression save things and reuse things. They had like glass bottles with nuts and bolts and buttons, you know. Um, so, but it takes work and labor to fix things. And now, you know, if you get a printer and it doesn't work, well, it's not worth taking it anywhere to have it fixed. You just throw it out, yeah. right? Because like, it costs $175 to even look at it. So we have to change some of our attitudes towards repairing shoes, consumer goods, and so on. Um, so I have the feeling that we're not really going to go in the direction of people only working, uh, you know, a day and a half a week, but rather that the nature of labor itself will change to be more efficient and to use things in a more careful way. You know, there's a whole whole lot of issues that yeah. you can comment on. Well, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, um, one of the things that I mentioned was that I think we need to have much stricter limits which, that we impose on ourselves in terms of what we take from nature and what we put back and how much land we occupy. In the absence of those limits, things appear to be a lot cheaper than they really are. Just like something which is highly carbon intensive because it doesn't cost anything to put carbon into the atmosphere, at least in North America, because we don't have any kind of trading system or anything like that. Um, it appears very cheap. In fact, we could be doing a lot of damage. So if we successfully set uh, a somewhat comprehensive r range of limits, and, and we are groping in that direction. I mean, the, that's what the, the, the thrust of the, uh, the uh, climate change work is all about, setting some global limit and dividing it up amongst the countries. Um, if we can succeed in doing that, then it will have an effect on prices. And then some of the things that you've pointed to, which we do because they seem cheap, will no longer seem cheap. They'll be high priced, and other things which are less damaging to the environment will have relatively lower prices. Now, as long as there's enough public support to bring these kinds of limits in, we've got a workable policy framework, because we know what we're trying to do, um, we, uh, we have the support for it, and we will end up with, a, with prices that give us much more reliable information. I'm one of those who believes that uh, 
we are all being totally misled by the prices that we face. There was a question about the discount rate. I'm not sure I even answered that properly. But, but you apply the discount rate to things that you valued in terms of prices. Well, if those prices are misaligned and, and, and just misleading, then the discounting is sort of just adding insult to injury. Um, so, I do, I think that's, so I think that's part of it. The other thing I wanted to say is, you know, you can look back at the last, what, 40 years to, to 1970, and you can, you can point to a whole host of changes. Some are good, from my perspective. Some aren't so good. Uh, I think we need to get a clearer fix on which ones we think are good. For example, there were no ministers of environment in 1970. There, was, there were very few places in universities where you could do environmental studies. It was hardly taught in the schools. Now we hear more and more how it's the kids who come home from school and, and pressure their parents to act in a better way. It's not been enough, but it's movement in the right direction. So what I'm saying is if we can be clearer on what changes have been, uh, we've, we've already been seeing and say, okay, how do we push those further and faster, and then hold back on some of the others which are taking us in the wrong direction, you know, you begin to develop a policy package and a, and a, and a, and a personal package that, uh, that, that gets us going in the right direction. I'm a big fan of the United Kingdom's uh, Optimum Population uh, Trust. Uh, they state that the optimum population of the world is about 3.5 billion. This would allow us all to live uh, at levels of consumption of first world European nations with reduced carbon output that we expect over the next uh, 25 to 30 years. I'm just wondering what you uh, would say to that, that figure of population, 3.5 billion. <laughs> well, I say let them go first. I mean, you know, uh, there's 60 million there to start with. You know, those kind of numbers are, are, are interesting because they, they, um, they get us to think about the right kinds of things. But I, uh, I do think that we have to, whatever we say, we're starting from where we are now. So if someone says that they think the, uh, the target population should be three and a half billion, uh, I'd like to see the game plan. <laughs> because that's really important. I mean, we have, I had a question about the police state. And this is, I mean, it's not, so uh, I, don't know what, I don't know what to make of that. Now, the other thing is, um, I don't think it makes great and necessary to set up the, the, the sort of the European lifestyle as the, as the level and, style and, and a type that everybody in the world should aspire to. That's, um, you know, that's a strikes of a certain kind of uh, Eurocentric uh, position. Um, there's got to, I, I'm hoping we'll have a lot more variation in things. So, you know, there have been other estimates uh, apart from that three and a half billion uh, get ranging up to much, well, lower numbers. I mean, Gaia, the Gaia man, which is, I forget now, but talks about two billion. And I, I love Locke, thank you. And then there have been estimates, you know, way, way higher than that. So, uh, you know, it's. I don't, I don't, I don't do, I don't do that kind of work myself. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Victor, for this uh, presentation. Um, I'm just wondering how much more valuable uh, your model would be if it incorporated um, risk, cost of risk. Uh, for example, if we adopted this model, say five years ago, would it have stopped the BP oil spill? and those, those types of costs that we're incurring now. Um, so if this Good model question. actually could take on a risk uh, factor, much like insurance companies do, yeah. and they try to forecast these sorts of things because of the activities yeah. and certain circumstances, this, um, you could find a lot more valuable. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's a really, a really good question, but then I know where you, you studied. Thank <laughs> you. York University. Yes, New um, Yorker. <laughs> um, I... I built the model to help me think through a particular question, which I put up there. Yes. Um, having done that, uh, of course, there are many other questions that we would like to address. I don't know that the answer is to sort of necessarily try and build it into this model, mm -hmm. or may, maybe it would be better to, to work with some other, other model. But it's an interesting question. I don't really have a ready answer to you. But what I would say is this. I do think there is a link between our pursuit of growth and what we're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, um, I think that what we're seeing, as some others have said, is this is what, this is what it looks like when cheap oil begins to 
not, be not available anymore. We push, we push, we push, we rely on the technology and, 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 it, and it's not resilient enough. So my position would be if we adopted the sort of direction that my model is pointing to of a slower rate of growth, we wouldn't be so dependent upon those extreme, um, extremely difficult sources of, of, of resources. So uh, that, to that extent, there's a connection. But um, this is a scenario casting kind of a model mm -hmm. to sort of try to deal with the question that was always, well, it still comes up. And that, well, we can't really fix the environment or we can't do this, we can't do that because it'll, it'll slow growth. Yes. And what I wanted to show was that maybe slowing growth in itself, neither here nor there, we can do quite well without it. That right. was really the purpose. Very good. Um, just one more quick uh, um, um, question. Uh, I agree with your points on uh, the use of technology and dependence on technology and what it's done. Also, the cost of technique, how we've become de-skilled because of this adoption of uh, technology. So we no yeah. longer make our own goods. Yeah. We no longer make our own, uh, produce our own food. Um, huge costs, I think, to society, especially uh, um, putting us at risk, too, uh, food security issues uh, in urbanized areas. Um, so perhaps I'm wondering how, uh, what your thoughts would be on pushing, we can use technology, but push it towards an industrial ecology, so we're not uh, doing any more material extraction. Maybe that can at least buy us more time, but maybe you have some thoughts on industrial ecology here. Yeah, well, for those of you not familiar with the term, the idea of industrial ecology is to set up an economic system that is more deliberately based on ecological principles. The idea being that within natural systems, there's little or no waste. The waste of one entity becomes input to another. And so why can't we have industrial systems that work in the same way? And there are examples where factories locate in the same area, and what was a waste product from one gets used as a, as a raw material input or material input to another. So it's a, it's a great principle. It's turned out to be quite difficult to implement because you've got to get these willing partners to come together. Um, but I like the idea, and I think that my proposal to have much stricter limits on material extraction, virgin materials, would give a great stimulus to the development of industrial ecology sites. So it, it fits together. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. This event was hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, an educational charity promoting science, reason, secularism, and free inquiry. CFI Canada coordinates branches and campus groups across the country, runs a public education series, provides secular community services, incorporates cutting-edge multimedia such as blogs, podcasts, and YouTube, and is a regular voice in the press presenting a secular humanist, atheist, and skeptical perspective. Visit us at www.cficanada.ca and contact us at info at cficanada.ca.